Welcome. This is Ann Windsor. And all of you that are new to the Divine Healing Questions and Answers page here on Facebook, I believe we had 14 new members today. I'd just like to welcome you and give you a little background on our bedtime stories. Here about a month ago, all of a sudden one night, I heard this little phrase in my heart, bedtime stories for those needing healing. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I got to thinking about it more and more. And as I did and I prayed about it, I felt like the Lord wanted me to do something along that line. So for several weeks now, we've been doing these and I'd invite you to go back and view the ones that were previously done. Tonight, we're going to talk about Father Abraham again. I believe we've done maybe one, one other bedtime story on him, maybe two, I can't remember right now. Abraham encountered the God who raises the dead. This is... A thing that you need to meditate on. The power that raises the dead. Because it is that power that heals your body. The Lord told me, he said, I want you to do these bedtime stories so that people will go to sleep thinking about my power. When I need healing, that is something I do habitually and not just at bedtime. I meditate on God's power, his might, his dunamis is the Greek word. And doesn't that word dunamis sound like something? It sounds like dynamite. So we, and you think about the explosive power of dynamite. God's dynamite power that raises the dead and it says in Romans 4 17 and it calls those things that are not into existence. Hallelujah. So we looked at a couple scriptures. Maybe you haven't run across them yourself in Isaiah 51 1 and 2. I encountered these several years ago, and it was just shocking to me, I guess I would say. Look unto the rock, Isaiah says, inspired by the Spirit. Look unto the rock from whence you have been hewn. Look unto the quarry from which you have been dug. Look unto Abraham, your faith father. And look unto Sarah, your faith mother. When I called him, he was childless. And I blessed him and increased him until his descendants are as the stars of the heaven. Last week we talked about Abraham and how God took him out in the night, clear in the Middle East. He looked up and saw all the stars, and the Lord says, count them if you can. And he went back in his tent, and the Lord said, so shall your seed be. And Abraham went back into his tent and was thinking about that, and as he thought about those stars, all of them turned into the faces of a child, calling Father Abraham. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you tonight as we begin. Lord, I worship you. You know the need of each person, physically, mentally, emotionally. You know where they need healing, Lord Jesus. 
I know, Father, that we're dealing specifically here with physical healing. But, Lord, you know if they need mental and emotional healing. You know if their will needs healing. Maybe they've given up hope. They've fallen down and can't get up. Oh, Father, do your marvelous and wonderful work of quickening them. Quicken them, Father. Heal them. Restore them. Father, in their will, in their emotions, in their mind, and in their body. And Father, I pray like Paul that you would enlighten the eyes of their heart so that they can comprehend the greatness of your power, Father, that is crying out to work on their behalf. And Father, I thank you tonight that you order my thoughts so that this wonderful story comes out line upon line, precept upon precept. And Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Well, just as Father Abraham, he is mentioned more in the New Testament because he is your faith father. You have believed on the Lord and have received righteousness as a free gift. You have been set right with God and justified in his sight, not by works, but by faith. And Father Abraham was the first one that it says he believed the Lord and God counted it to him for righteousness. In Galatians, Paul says, you are the seed, the offspring of Abraham. So just as God was encouraging Israel, they were in a backslidden, desperate state, and the Lord wanted to renew their faith. And he said, stop and look past Moses. Look past the sacrifices and the offerings. Look back to your father, Abraham. He is the rock from whence you have been hewn, cut. He is the, Sarah is the quarry from which you have come. They are your examples. So that's why we are looking at Father Abraham. I believe you're just going to be very blessed this evening. God wants you to be filled Oh, put your hand on yourself right now and say, God wants me filled with the knowledge, filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal me, filled from your toes to the top of your head. God wants me filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal me. The Holy Spirit is in me. Just keep saying it with me. The Holy Spirit is in me. The Holy Spirit is with me. He is ready to heal. He is ready to heal. No that he wants to release himself in you. God wants you to be filled. You know, I sensed two things the Lord wanted me to share with you along that line. He wants you filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal you. Filled with it. And when he said that to me, I saw a cup, just a cup, and I saw it filling up with a liquid. And when the liquid leveled off at the top, he said, that means filled. 
He wants you filled. You have the power, but he wants you filled with the knowledge. The power is here in your belly, in your spirit, manifest from the belly area of your body. But he wants your understanding, your knowledge filled with the truth that he wants to heal you. I looked up a little picture here for you. I hope it comes out. Let's see how it does. Yeah, this is a golden goblet. And you see it's filled. That's what the Lord means. Now there's gems in there, rubies and emeralds and diamonds. You could say that is the cu your cup of knowledge. And each one of those little gems is a healing verse. Or it's something the Lord has shown you personally about getting healing manifested in your body. All your little gems. Your conversations with God about health and healing. Your thinking about the stripes of Jesus. Your meditating on the power that raised him from the dead. The cup. When your cup is full, the Lord said he wants your cup of knowledge full. So that's another reason that this page exists. Is to help you fill up your cup of knowledge that God wants you well. The Holy Spirit, again, he is in you, plus he's with you. He is ready to heal. You need to know that he wants, he wants to release the Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit is in your spirit, man. He's not, don't dwell in your body. He doesn't dwell in your emotions. He doesn't dwell in your head. He doesn't dwell in your will. You are a spirit. What kind of spirit are you? According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Your old moral and spiritual condition, the sinful nature, has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new have come. And that fresh and that new that is in you is the nature of God, Zoe, his life. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit does not live in your soul and your body. He lives in your spirit and he wants to be released. He is groaning to get out. Right now, the verse in Romans 8, 26 to 28 comes to me, where it says, When you know not what to pray for, as you ought, the Holy Spirit prays for you with a groan coming out of your inner man. I found myself, different times, I'll start sighing. I'm shopping in the grocery store. I'm going, driving home in the car, in my house, putting the groceries away, whatever I'm doing. I go through periods of sighing. It doesn't happen very often, but it takes a hold of me at periods of time. And it just starts happening with like, as easy as breathing. And it isn't like a disgusted sigh. And it isn't like, I'm tired of this sigh. You're, I'm just doing it. And at times like that, the first time it happened to me, I thought, my, that's peculiar. And the Lord said to me, those are the groanings of the Spirit. You're sighing. You're, you're groaning in the Spirit. That sigh is a groaning in the Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is groaning in you wanting to be released. He wants you healed more than you want healed. Oh, it, it, if I could... It makes tears run down out of my eyes. It makes my heart cry inside to find the words to tell you how much he wants to be released and heal you. 
Hallelujah. So God is not withholding anything. You don't have to beg and plead and cry. When you were born again, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead took up residence in you. Hallelujah. So that was one thing the Lord wanted me to tell you. He wants you filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal you. Say that. God wants me filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal me. And another thing that he said to me today was, he said, you need to tell them that they are not in the flesh. They're already in the spirit. So they don't have to try to, well, we have to get in the spirit to get healing. If you read the section in Romans, where Paul is talking about the carnal mind is the enemy of God. Those that are in the flesh can't please God. I'm going to go over here right quick and read it to you. <clears throat> that the righteousness, God, okay, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. See, it's talking about our walk. It's not talking about the element that you're living in. You are to walk. That's your daily life. You're to live your life after the Spirit. Okay? But this, you're already in the element of the Spirit. That's what makes you able to walk after the Spirit in your daily life. You have to have life inside to walk. That's like when you became a baby. You got human life, and because you had life, you were able to walk. Well, you've got the life. You're in the Spirit, and the Spirit's in you. Paul's talking here about walking, walking your daily life. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, then he goes on. He says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is the enemy of God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now he's writing to the Romans here. They weren't perfect Christians. And he's telling them, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. What qualifies that to be true? That you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. Read it for yourself. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, then he is none of his. So the Lord wanted me to tell you because there's so many things that get said and are tried to practice about, oh, we have to get in the Spirit. We have to pray so long. We have to sing so long. We, Sweetie pie, when it's the middle of the night and you're in pain, you don't have time to go through all that. That's why the Lord wants you to know you're already in the Spirit. You were born you are alive in the realm of healing right now. You were born into it when you were born in. You are alive in the realm, the supernatural realm, in the life of God. You're alive in the Holy Spirit right now. If you don't didn't have the Spirit of Christ, you wouldn't be. But you got the Spirit of Christ when you got born again. So you are now alive in the realm of healing. The realm where healing comes from. You're already alive in it. You don't have to try to get there. You were born into it. You don't have to try to get in the spirit. And even Paul said then in Galatians 5.25, if you live in the spirit, if, you're, if we live in the spirit, which we do, he said, then let us walk in the spirit. 
See, that's what the Lord wants to, going on here. The Lord wants to give you wisdom of how to walk out your healing. You're already alive in the realm of healing, where I find the biggest problem is the gap from having it to getting it manifested. It's, there's a chasm there, and we lack wisdom and understanding of how to bridge that chasm. <clears throat> Looking again at our little cup of confidence. Years ago, Oral Roberts used to say, how do you know that you're confident? When you know that you know that you know. <laughs> Keep feeding. And until you get to that point, some of you are still struggling with symptoms when they come, and it causes you to waver. Maybe you get fearful again. Fear, you deal with fear. You can be dealing with all kinds of things. I used to call fear the bugaboos under my bed at night. But when you get to that place, there's a place that Oral Roberts talked about. And it is a confidence that nothing can shake. It is a settled fact, not only in heaven, but it's in you. And it isn't a head knowledge thing. It's a concrete thing that sets up on the inside of you. I mean, your head can be off who knows what, and your body can be going through you who knows what. But inside, because you have filled that cup of knowledge, you've come to the place that you know, that you know, that you know. Hallelujah. So how do we do that? Keep feeding on faith stories, faith verses. Pray in tongues over the verses you read. This is something else that I don't think people get taught today. I would get in services and the teaching would start getting really, really good. And I would sense, um, oh, what can I call it? The frequency of God coming alive in a different way. And I wanted to catch it. I wanted to catch it. I could sense it in my spirit. I could sense the waters churning in there. And I wanted to catch it. I wanted to get what it, I wanted to get what he was talking about. I didn't want to just hear it. I wanted to get it. And so I just sit there and I'd start. I wouldn't pray loud enough to disturb people around me. I wouldn't pray louder than what I could still hear what the speaker was saying. But you see, that's what you need to do. When you hear some kind of message and all of a sudden sparks start going off on the inside of you, that means the Lord is wants to quicken something. He wants to work something into you that's being taught. And so just hook up right then and just start praying in tongues. See, what is praying in tongues for? You may hear that truth, and you know there's something meaty in it, but you don't know how to get to it. See, there's our infirmities. We're infirm in how to get a hold of spiritual things. We're infirm in our understanding a lot of the times. And so when you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit takes a hold together with you to help you get that engrafted into your life, to open your understanding about God's ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So pray in tongues when certain verses, read them slowly. And when you sense, oh, there's something in there, start, just stop, keep the verse in front of you, and start, just put your hand on it, and just start praying in the Spirit. Oh, Lamasanda, Lamasanda. Just like our verse about Abraham. Look unto the rock from whence you have been hewn. Look unto the quarry from which you have been dug. Look unto Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, your mother. I went, whoa, what is that? And I knew there was something there, but I didn't know. I knew God was speaking. I knew he was speaking for a reason. I knew that there was more there, but just a reading I was not getting. It's like a road stretching out in front of you. All of a sudden it goes whew, like that. And you're going, whoa, look at that. And you want to get on that road. 
and you want to go down it. But the Holy Spirit's the teacher, and he has to show you how. Hallelujah. So that's an example. So I look at that verse. I think about it, I quote it to myself, and then I pray in tongues. Hmm. Olamasandalamakandalamasata, the rock from which I have been hewn. Hmm. Olamasandalamakalamashingedamasundadava, quarry from which I have been dug. Hmm. Soramakidamashikatamasandalamasata. I've been praying over this verse and fellowshipping with this verse for several years. So pray in tongues over verses that you're reading. Knead them. That's how you knead them, like kneading a bread dough. Knead them into you. Fill your confidence cup to running over. Feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Pour in the clean water and dr that drives out the dirty water. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say to me so sweetly, the shepherd has provided the pasture. You just need to feed and embrace what you're feeding on. The shepherd, capital S, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down and feed in green pastures. The Lord has provided the pasture. He's provided the word for you to feed from. He's provided you with teachers Hallelujah, and pastors and prophets. He's provided the pasture. You just need to feed and embrace what you're feeding on. You know, to embrace something, you can look at it, you can read it, but embracing it to you is a whole other thing. Hallelujah. I'm sure you understand. <clears throat> I've taken Romans chapter 4 about Father Abraham. God has given me the ability. You know, when I was very young, I think I was 27 years old, I love to tell this story because it's who I am, really, and it's why I can do what I do. My children were all small. I think my youngest was, or my oldest was in kindergarten. I had two others. I was sitting at a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and the couple that was there called me up and said, the Lord wants us to lay hands on you and give you wisdom and knowledge in the word. You know what wisdom is? Wisdom is multifaceted. It's the ability to look at something from many different views, like you're looking at a mountain and you're seeing it from different, you go around it, you can see the same mountain, but you see it from different angles. So the Lord has given me the ability with the Word of God to take something totally unrelated maybe to healing and see healing in it. So that's what I've done here with Romans 4. Oh, I delighted in doing this today. So I want to read it to you. This is from the Message Bible. Romans 4, Trusting God. So how do we know, how do we fit what we know of Abraham, our first father in the faith, into this new way of looking at things, this faith way instead of works way? If Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to heal him, he could have taken credit for it. <laughs> but the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. What we read in Scripture is, mm, are you ready for a tasty morsel? What we read in Scripture is, Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. Abraham entered 
into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. Working hard to get healing isn't a gift. But if you see that the job is too big for you, that is something only God can do. If you see working hard to get healing isn't a gift, if you see the job is too big for you, then it's only something God can do. And you trust him to do it. You could never do it for yourself no matter how hard and long you worked. Well, that trusting him to do it is what gets you healed by God. It's a sheer gift. We all agree, don't we, that it was by embracing what God did for him that Abraham was declared physically fit? We all agree, don't we, that it was by embracing what God did for him that Abraham was declared physically fit to have a child. Remember? Him and Sarah's bodies were as good as dead. What are we talking about tonight? Abraham encountered the God who raises the dead. You know you have to. Hallelujah. When you heard the word of the gospel and were saved and you were born again, you encountered the God that raises the dead. You were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins and you have already experienced the greatest healing and the greatest exertion of God's power that could you could experience by being born again, by being translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son. If God could cause you to be born again, he can do anything for you. That's something to think about. When you want to think about if God has enough power to deal with your sickness or your disease or your infirmity, then you need to stop and think how much power he exerted to see that you were born again, that your spirit was refathered from above, that the sin nature was driven out, and the nature from God was imparted, and you became a new creation in Christ. Think about that when it comes to healing. Salvation and healing are two sides of the same coin. <clears throat> We all agree, don't we, that it was by embracing what God did for him that Abraham was declared fit physically. And it means further that Abraham is the father of all people who embrace what God does for them. <laughs> it means further that Abraham is the father of all people who embrace what God does for them. Abraham, oh, get this now. Abraham is father of those who are willing to live in the risky faith embrace of God's action for them. The risky faith embrace. It always feels risky when you're standing for healing. Always feels risky because the symptoms are right out here. And they're telling you it's not going to work, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, nothing's happening. You are in a risky faith embrace. Oh, I love this. And you have to take the risk to step out, step out into the rivers of life. Hallelujah. God enjoys. Abraham took a risk. He said, Abraham, leave your father's house and your country and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Do you know how far it is from, from Haran, clear down into the land of Canaan? Look on, a, look on a biblical map sometime. That's how far he traveled in faith, that there was going to be something there when he got there. And what was there? Well, we won't get into all that story right now. I want to go on. 
Abraham is the father of those who are willing to live in the risky faith embrace of God's action for them. That famous promise God gave Abraham that he and his children would possess the earth was not given because of something Abraham did or would do. It was based on God's decision to put everything together for him. <laughs> God has decided to put all your little broken places together for you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. That famous promise God gave Abraham that he and his children would possess the earth was not given because of something Abraham did or would do. It was based on God's decision to put everything together for him, which Abraham then entered when he believed. Oh, if those who get what God gives them only get it by doing everything they're told to do and filling out all the right forms properly signed, that eliminates personal trust completely and turns the promise into an ironclad contract. That's not a holy promise, that's a business deal. A contract drawn up by a hard-nosed lawyer and with plenty of fine print that makes sure you will never be able to collect. <laughs> but if there is no contract in the first place, simply a promise to heal. And God's promise at that. You cannot break it and God isn't going to. This is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God and his way and then simply embracing him and what he does. Oh, Father, I embrace your healing. I embrace the quickening by your spirit of my mortal body. Every organ, every tissue, every ligament, the marrow of my bones. Father, I embrace your work giving me a sound mind. I embrace your healing power healing my broken emotions. I embrace your strength for my will, Father. Oh, he's holding out. Let's embrace what he's holding out. Let's embrace what he's deposited within. See, right now a verse is coming to me in Romans 10. I'll go over here. The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring da Christ down from above. See, we just get in this desperate mode when we need him. We say, oh, if I could only see Jesus. Oh, if he'd only just come down here and heal me. See, you're doing you're acting like the Israelites in the Old Testament, and that is not the righteousness that comes by faith. You're wanting a work done, some kind of supernatural sign. Who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh unto you even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. See, and that's what our goal is here on the Divine Healing page. When you don't have anybody to pray for you, and you don't have a dream, and you don't have a vision, and you don't have Jesus appearing to you and laying hands on you, you can get healed by filling yourself with that knowledge. Like the Lord said, how did he say that? God wants you to be filled with the knowledge that he wants you well. And believe me, as you fill yourself with that knowledge, something just starts happening in there. That healing power just starts flowing automatically. Hallelujah. There's just an automatic flow. Just keep feeding. Keep embracing. And as you do, the flow will just get going, and it'll just keep going. And you say, oh my, all of a sudden I feel better. Oh, ah, that pain's gone today. Hallelujah. Work with God. He wants to work with you. Hallelujah. The word is not you, even in your mouth and in your heart. 
This is, the, this is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God in his way and then simply embracing him and what he does. God's promise of healing has arrived as a pure gift. That's the only way everyone, ev that's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Abraham is the father of us all. He's not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He's our faith father. We call Abraham father because he got God's attention, he, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life and with a word make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, as good as dead, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, Oh, Abraham, you're going to have a big family. Verse 19. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence, the condition of his body, and say, It's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence, the condition of his body, and say it's hopeless. This hun it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he focus on Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. We get ourselves, how did the Lord say that again? God wants to fill you with the knowledge that he wants to heal you. We get ourselves so filled up with doctor's reports of our condition or thinking about getting our medicines or taking them. We get filled up with all of this knowledge. God wants you to get filled up with the knowledge that he wants to heal you. Hallelujah. So that your focus is shifted from your impotence and your barrenness. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise asking cautiously skeptical questions. Oh, he plunged into the promise, plunged into it, and came up strong, ready for God, and sure that God would make good on what he said. Sure, see, that's how why the Lord wants you to get filled with the knowledge that he wants to heal you, because he wants to have, you to have the same sureness that Abraham had that God will make good on his promise. And see, Jesus is the author. Okay, let me finish this first. That's why it is said, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to quicken his dead body. But it's not just Abraham, it's also us. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe the one who brought Jesus to life when conditions were equally hopeless. <laughs> it's not just Abraham, it's also us. The same thing that we're declared fit before God huh, by trusting him to quicken our dead bodies. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe the one, capital O, who brought Jesus to life when the conditions were equally hopeless. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord and let's hang out with that rock from which we have been hewn. 
and that quarry from whence we have been dug. Let us hang out with our father, our faith father, Abraham, and our faith mother, Sarah. Here in Romans 4, again, it says, Abraham is the father of both the circumcision, that's the Jew, and the uncircumcision, the Gentile. He is the father of those who walk in the steps of that faith that our father Abraham walked in. Hallelujah. Walking in the steps of your father Abraham. So you have to read his story. As you read his story, you're walking through his story with him. You'll see how he grew in his trust. He grew in his, how did the Lord say that to you again? His knowledge. He grew in the knowledge, the confidence, your cup of confidence. He grew in the confidence that God would perform what he said. And he saw it over and over and over through the years as he kept walking with him. God kept giving him victories. God kept delivering him out of sticky situations he got himself into. God kept blessing him. And then, to end all, he, Sarah, 90 years old, and Abraham have a child. Whew. Think of it. 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 Sarah barren her entire life, 70 years, and she had ceased with her menstrual cycles. Abraham's body by then himself, impotent, impossible, in a, unable to perform, to have a child. Think of it. Then put your healing next to the situation they were in and compare the two. And then reason, the Lord says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Then reason it out, say, well, what is my situation compared to Abraham and Sarah? I'm not dead yet. Maybe you do have an area of your body that's dead and isn't working. That's another reason to look at their example. God restored, he said, Sarah's time of life. So in other words, he restored her menstrual cycle. And he not only restored it, he made her fertile for the first time in her life. He restored Abraham's ability to have sexual relations with her, to plant the seed in her so Isaac could be conceived. Think of the faith the two of them had when they came together that first time after being having bodies as good as dead for who knows how long. See, that's what I said. We have to walk in the footsteps of our father Abraham. Don't just read the stories. Live them. And as you're living them, you are filling yourself with knowledge of God's ways and his will. Hallelujah. His thoughts towards you. Thank you, Father. Next time, I just love talking about Father Abraham, don't you? <laughs> and you know, I, I think too, and you think too, he's the part of the family that's in heaven. Paul talked about the whole family, the part that's in heaven and the part that's in the earth. And one of these days, you're going to see Father Abraham and Mother Sarah. You're going to see them. I can't hardly wait. I feel like sometimes I just like to just kiss his face all over and say thank you, thank you, thank you for being the first person that trusted God like you did, that took God at his word. Though Abraham believed the Lord. Oh, just listen to those wonderful words. Abraham believed the Lord. And in Hebrews, it says, He who comes to God must first of all believe that he is. Hebrews eleven six. And I know you all do that. And after that, it says, And that you believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
That's what Father Abraham believed. He knew God was, and he believed that God would reward him as he believed him. And brother, Father Abraham believed the Lord. And see, God performed his word, and he got the reward. Oh. Father, I just worship you tonight. What a privilege, Father, to believe you. The God with whom all of these things that we need in our lives on this earth have been provided. Thank you, Lord, that they flow to us through your Spirit, provided by your Son's work on the cross. Oh, Father, I pray for those that are with me live, those that will watch later. Oh, Father, I pray that their cup would be filled, that they'll put the effort into filling their cup with the knowledge that you want to heal them so that the power to heal that is in them can be released. So the faucet will open that's in our soul and the flow can be released. Oh, I worship you, 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 Father. Thank you, you are the God who raises the dead and calls things that be not as though they were. Thank you, you quicken dead limbs. You restore dead visions. Oh, Father, you encourage those that have lost their hope. People that are, their emotions are dead, Father. You raise them up, Father, people whose minds are in a state of atrophy. Oh, Father, I just come against Alzheimer's at work in the brain. In brains, Father, that put minds in prison so that people can't express themselves anymore. Just pray in the spirit with me for a little bit. Help us grow, Father. Help us grow. Help us grow. Help us grow. Help everything that Jesus died to provide be put on us, Father. Help us to grow, to travail. To, that's it. Paul said, my little children of whom I travail in birth so Christ can be formed in you. And Father, we know that Christ has been formed in us in the area of salvation. And we want to see Christ formed in us in the area of healing. Oh, Father, Solama, 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 Sholama, Shikalamata. Show us the way, Father, to form him in our physical bodies. Oh, Father, we praise you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who's with us and in us to teach us, to speak to us the little whispers. This is the way, walk ye in it. Thank you, Lord. You are the author, and what you have begun in our spirits, you are able to finish in our bodies as we walk in your counsel and listen to your voice. Father, these that have trouble bridging the gap, Father, from what they know to be true to the manifestation, Father, I pray that you will give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in how to bridge that gap. Father, the prescription is different for each person. There's little things you say, do this, don't do that. And you will lead them into wellness and health and restoration. Give them courage, Father. Sometimes when they've been in a situation for so long, limbs, stiff limbs and different things, it takes courage to step out and Put your arm out or put your foot out or get up or whatever it may be. Father, what we need to ex exercise that courage. And Father, let our faith grow 
And Father, we thank you that each day we're making progress. Each day, Father, you're working in bodies. And Lord, I just thank you tonight for those that have joined me, for those that shall tune in later. I pray, Father, that again this wonderful bedtime story about Father Abraham will fill their heart with love and confidence and faith towards you. And Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name, amen and amen. Next time we're going to look at Paul's prayer in, in Ephesians. You might want to look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be opened so you could see the greatness of the power that is available to work on your behalf. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and raised him up and seated him in heavenly places. That power. Hallelujah. So this week, or this time, we talked about Abraham encountered the God who raises the dead. Next week, we're going to talk about the God who raises the dead again when he raised Jesus from the dead. God bless you all. Thank you for joining me, Ann Windsor. Have a pleasant night. Sleep well and think again about the power of God as you go to sleep.